back in control. Turkey's president warns of severe consequences after a failed military coup. But what were the motives behind the attempt to overthrow the government? And what does it mean for democracy in Turkey? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Fauzia Ibrahim. After a violent night that saw bomb blasts, airstrikes and gunfire across Turkey, hundreds of people have been killed or injured. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan says his government is now in control and that the attempted coup has failed. The president also warns that those responsible will be paying a heavy price. Many arrests have followed. Some soldiers have surrendered, but the president wants his supporters to remain vigilant. At the heart of this failed coup is the role played by Turkey's people. Thousands came out in support of their democratically elected government. And Turkey's acting chief of staff has thanked them for their support during the crisis. This attempted coup has been pushed back by the Turkish armed forces. Our people invited by our president and prime minister walked into the streets and squares in front of tanks and other military vehicles and prevented the coup's success. This was a historic cooperation between the state and the people of Turkey. However, Turkey has witnessed the madness of a group which fired at, bombed its own parliament, its own people, its own resources. This will never be forgotten. We are grateful to every citizen who stood for democracy. Turkey has closed the era of military coups once and for all. Now, military coups in Turkey have overthrown four civilian governments in the past 50 years. A young military officer carried out the first coup in the Turkish Republic in 1960. The president, prime minister and others were arrested and tried for treason. Eleven years later, an economic downturn led to widespread unrest. The military stepped in to try and restore order. In 1980, violence between left and right-wing groups led to another military coup. Hundreds of thousands of protesters were arrested and dozens were executed. In 1997, the military offered a series of what it called recommendations after the rise of the Welfare Party. The Prime Minister was forced to resign. Well, since President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and the AK party came to power in 2002, the role of the military seems to have diminished. Turkey is dealing with several issues, including a Kurdish separatist movement, combating the armed group ISIL, the war in Syria and the refugee crisis. Now, President Erdogan has been accused of targeting hundreds of military officers over investigations into alleged coups. Many of them were put on trial and some were forced into a retirement. During this time, the police and intelligence services were strengthened to counter the role of the military. After Friday night's attempted coup, Erdogan says those responsible will pay a heavy price. It's time now to bring in our guests. And in Istanbul, we have Galip Daley. He is a senior fellow in Turkey and Kurdish studies at the Al Jazeera Center for Studies. In Brunice, Netherlands, joining us on Skype, we have Ian Lesser. He is the senior director for foreign policy at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Also in Istanbul, we have Jan Kasapoglu, defense analyst at the Center for Economics and Foreign Policy. Thank you so much for being with us. Now, Galip Delay, if I could start with you. The coup seems to have started strong. We saw dramatic footage of soldiers and tanks on the Bosporus Bridge. We saw the parliament being bombed. We saw the national broadcaster being taken off air. And then it fizzled out. Why? Well, actually, it didn't start out as strong in the first place. It showed the, uh, it tried to show the image of the strength, but the coup has started from a very, uh, very weak point, and it was more an expression of desperation and weakness, actually, rather than strength. Uh, strength. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first reasons for it uh, that it was quite weak is because it did not have a consensus within the military. The most of the military that we knew, even during the, uh, even during the coup, when the coup was in uh, progress, we knew, the public knew that the uh, vast majority of the military are not in favor of this coup. And in one way or another, everyone knows it. And the second that the coup tried to replicate 
uh, uh, tactics that belongs to the 1980s, 1970s, mm -hmm. when you could, like you know, when you could take over the state broadcast, uh, state broadcasting institutions, and there was no other private and or no other, no any other broadcasting institution, no social media. So once you could take over the state broadcasting institution, basically you do, you would have the ultimate power over the. Uh, information flow mm -hmm. but when this happens b people like on social media people through private channels uh, people through twitters facebook all sudden that has been news has been spread all over the turkey and the voice of the criticism came in immediately immediately you saw a very significant backlash from people immediately you start to see like you know people more and more trying to take in to the string uh, to the streets and uh, the government officials uh, very soon uh, appeared on the public television or through the FaceTime messages, uh, uh, sorry, private telev TV channels or through the FaceTime messages or mm -hmm. using other social media accounts. They, uh, they framed the coup very well. They uh, more or less told the people who are behind it and they also conveyed the message that uh, a very uh, large segment of the uh, military is not in right. favor of this action. So what has right. started, what, what, what tried to like give an image of strength actually mm -hmm. was a sign, an, uh, a sign of uh, desperation mm -hmm. rather than strength. Ian, if, if, Ian Lesser, if I could bring you into uh, the discussion now, was it a case of poor planning on the part of those who decided to launch the coup or is it a case that they underestimated the sort of support that they would get? Well, I suspect it was both. I, I think uh, Galik is absolutely right. Uh, this was obviously a, a small faction, potentially a very small faction within the military. There wasn't a broad base of support within the military establishment, and certainly there wasn't a broad base of support in society. Um, and it's you know we're obviously going to have to learn a lot more about the motives and how this unfolded, uh, but it seems to be rather amateurish at, at many different levels. And and as has been observed, uh, something in terms of its tactics that might have been appropriate decades ago, but simply does not work in an age of modern media. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's exactly what we saw here. Jan Kasapoglu, uh, ever since Erdogan's election in 2003, we've seen the military's uh, power decline. Was this a desperate attempt by certain factions within the military to try to reclaim that power? Well, first, we should understand the characteristics and the profile of the coup. As my colleagues just mentioned, this is a small faction within the armed forces. Uh, this is completely out of the chain of command. Uh, so, yes, this could be a desperate action by the remnants of the problematic civil military relations tradition of the 1990s and before. Mm -hmm. But in general, the transformed civil military relations into a more democratic Western standardized uh, one uh, just kept uh, the high command of the Turkish armed forces out of this plot. So far, according to the open news that we have been following in Turkey, there is only one single four-star general within the Turkish armed forces who was completely removed from uh, power positions uh, who is allegedly involved with this uh, plot. Mm -hmm. Then all other top chain of command of the Turkish armed forces uh, were in support of the democratically elected government. So. Uh, this could be uh, the, the, the last remnant of the, the problematic civil military relations uh, of the, the Turkish uh, domestic politics. Mr. Kasaboglu, let me follow up by asking you this question. The, the thousands of people that we saw uh, streaming onto the streets in opposition of this coup, was that a rejection of the coup or was that in support of Erdogan or was it a support of democracy? Well, I think uh, uh, all, of, all of the options, all of the, uh, the ideas that you have voiced uh, were mixed up in the feelings of the Turkish <clears throat> people. I can say that this failed coup attempt uh, were thwarted in three milestones, three historic milestones uh, yesterday overnight. The first one was President Erdogan calling people uh, via FaceTime uh, in a live TV broadcast called people to the streets mm -hmm. uh, to take up uh, democracy and defend their democracy, defend the democratically elected government. That was the first turning point. And the second turning point, before, before President uh, just called people for defending democracy, the Prime Minister openly uh, voiced uh, and explained that 
uh, the coup is uh, overrun by the, the, the coup is overtaken by a small junta within the Turkish mm. armed forces, and he just called this uh, he just called the coup attempt as an uprising, as an illegal uprising of a small group within the armed forces. So this mm -hmm. was the second turning point, and the third turn, uh, turning point, my some point, or the overnight was the commanders, like two star and three star generals, uh, they just lined up to the live TV broadcast and openly ordered their units to return back to their barracks mm -hmm. and top commanders of the armed forces via Turkish media, they openly, openly stated that the Turkish armed forces top chain of command mm -hmm. is not in support of this illegal uh, right. coup attempt. Right. So all these three milestones were also translated on the street as mix up uh, reactions mm -hmm. of the Turkish people Galip in, in favor of democracy. Galip Delay, was the coup's failure a reflection of support for President Erdogan or a support for Turkey's democracy? Some people would say it's two separate things. Uh, well, I think like for this matter, uh, for this matter specifically, it wasn't two different things. For this matter specifically, it was more or less the same thing. Like you know, on other uh, on other issues, you can perfectly say these are two different things, and mm -hmm. it is uh, two different things. But on yesterday's event, it was more or less seen as one. So not everyone uh, took up a stance against this uh, failed coup. Was the support of the AK Party? I think one of the very important hallmark of the yesterday that the rejection of this coup attempt was not a partisan it was not only the government of party but, but it was all the leader of the uh, parties represented within the parliament came forward against this coup and also another very significant development i think yesterday that there were two heroes one of them the turkish public but the, another one was turkey's media turkey media usually known for its low quality turkey media is uh, usually known for its uh, you know less of credit but mm -hmm. yesterday when it came to this uh, taking a stance against uh, uh, this coup turkish media whether critical of whether critical to the AK party or supporter of it mm -hmm. whether on the left or right whether on the whether the kurdish or you know the turkish nationalist they took very more or less a united stance against the coup so, in a sense, one of the major lessons that one can draw from yesterday's uh, event is that the issue of democracy, the resistance towards and uh, toppling, uh, military toppling of the civilian politics, mm -hmm. has long passed, has long become mm -hmm. uh, non-partisan issues, which I think is one of the strength of Turkish democracy and one of the strength that can further uh, th that shows the maturity of Tur Turkish democracy right. and I think here also the government has a very significant responsibility seeing that the people are not condoning its overthrow by an illegitimate means mm -hmm. the government should take comfort from this and use this as a platform for national reconciliation mm -hmm. seeing that even the uh, media critical to him even the people who are critical of him even the opposition within the party, they all reject this illegal uh, toppling of him, should give him a comfort and should initiate a new nationwide reconciliation mm -hmm. process because what has started as a menace yesterday can turn into a uh, boon for uh, Turkey's national reconciliation. Right. I, I want to come back to that point a little later. But uh, Ian Lesser, we've been looking at the uh, domestic uh, reaction uh, in Turkey. Let's take a look at how the international reaction uh, to this failed coup. Now, it was swift. I just want to quote a few things to you. The U.S. White House said that all parties in Turkey should support the democratically elected government of Turkey. German Chancellor Angela Merkel said that the democratic order must be respected in Turkey. The European Union said it fully supports the democratically elected government. NATO called for all parties to respect Turkey's democratic institutions. It's interesting that not one of those statements mentioned support for President Erdogan. What are you reading into this? Well, I think they said exactly the right thing. And uh, of course, this is the approach that uh, Western governments have taken in many cases, not only uh, in Turkey in the past, but also uh, looking to other settings like Asia. 
uh, where civil military relations are a fundamental part of our relationship. And, and so I think this is precisely the point. And, you know, it really isn't about support for President Erdogan or the AKP government per se. It is a point about support for democracy mm -hmm. and the subordination of military to civil power in Turkey. So mm -hmm. I think in that sense, everyone was pretty much on the same page, and it was a very predictable page and a correct one. Um, uh, that said, uh, it's not a surprise that in Western governments there has been a great deal of disillusionment with President Erdogan and the AKP government in recent years. Mm -hmm. But I don't really think that comes into play here. I think for governments in Europe and the United States, it really is about civil military relations, it's about democracy, it's about the desire not to see further coups in Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, Turkey is the second largest military establishment in NATO. What happens in civil military relations in Turkey actually matter a great deal. Um, the sort of thing that you saw, you know, is pretty much unthinkable in any other NATO setting. And so this will inevitably be disturbing to people, and people will be trying to parse the implications of this for some time to come. Uh, Jan Kasavoglu, I just want to take up on something that Mr. Delay had said, and that is President Erdogan should use this opportunity to push for national reconciliation. As we know, uh, there, there is some discord, particularly with the Kurdish uh, faction. There's a lot of discord within Turkey itself. Do you think he will use this to push for national reconciliation, or do you think he will use this to further strengthen his own executive powers? Well, this is the <clears throat> best chance for President Erdogan to unify the nation around the very goal of establishing a prosperous uh, democracy for Turkey because yesterday, as my colleagues just said, uh, all the parties, including the opposition parties, including the har very harsh opposition against Erdogan mm -hmm. within the Turkish press itself, were in support of the democratically elected government and the president and against the coup. So now we have a crossroads in Turkey. And I think President Erdogan just saw that by, by unifying the nation, he could gather the support, gather the support of uh, the circles within the society that have never been uh, in support of the president. Uh, so from now on, I think the, the most important determinant of the trajectory in Turkey would be the prosecution. Because now, as we are just uh, are, uh, on our broadcast, uh, there are approximately like 3,000 men in uniform under arrest for coup allegations, and this seems to extend to Turkish judiciary and other <coughs> circles of uh, the capital Ankara. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, the answer to your question is basically I think President Erdogan would, in, in an ideal situation, uh, opt for uh, unifying the nation around a prosperous democracy after uh, the successful uh, managing uh, the crisis uh, overnight, mm -hmm. but the prosecution itself and the revealed details uh, soon coming uh, will determine the trajectory of, of the Turkish administration. Mm. Ian Lesser, I, I want to bring you back in. Now, there is a thought that perhaps as President Erdogan has been pushing for to grant himself even more political power by changing the constitution uh, to create an executive presidency, do you think he will use this opportunity to strengthen his power even more under the name of national security? Well, I think, you know, as our discussion is so far uh, focused on, the Erdogan and the AKP government will now have a choice in what political path to take going forward. Uh, a path of reconciliation or uh, a path of consolidation of power. Um, you know, to date, the history has been one of consolidation and pressing for a presidential system. Mm. Um, I, you know, it is very clear that uh, opposition and liberal forces in Turkey are going to be watching very closely to see what comes out of this. Mm. Um, I would hope, uh, as has been said, that the government takes the opportunity uh, to take a more open approach uh, towards reconciliation because Turkey has a number of extremely violent cleavages at the moment that need to be re re reconciled. Mm -hmm. uh, but this may not be the case. And there is also the option we have to recognize uh, that Turkey will go down the path of further polarization. Uh, in any case, this is going to make it very, very difficult for uh, Turkey to deal with uh, the international environment, tourism, investment. Uh, other aspects of Turkey's international connections will be watching all of this very carefully. Mm. Now, Galip Dalai, let's, let's broaden out this discussion a little bit more. Of course, whatever happens in Turkey 
has an impact on the region as well. What do you think this attempted or this failed coup, what message is that sending out to uh, other uh, uh, countries in the neighborhood? And I'm thinking particularly uh, in Syria, where Erdogan has made it very clear that President Assad has to be removed from power. Well, I don't think that this, uh, uh, particularly yesterday's uh, failed coup in itself, has a very significant impact uh, on the Turkish regional policy. Mm -hmm. If anything, that sends the message to the region that the uh, current AK Party government is there and strong, and particularly after this failed attack, uh, the failed coup attempt, there is the only way to change this government is through democratic means. Mm -hmm. And that's right now, given the fact that it doesn't look like that we're going to have election anytime soon, this is the government that they need to deal with and this is the government that they're going to deal with. So mm -hmm. right now, if anyone has any hope to get rid of this government through non-democratic means, more or less that has been used and squandered and uh, this is not a way to go. And the secondly, I think, uh, we have talked about the yesterday's uh, coup, uh, failed coup very much, but we haven't talked much about, like, you know, who was really behind it. There isn't a single group in Turkey that has any doubt about who actually was behind it, which is, uh, you know, which is the Gülenist movement within Turkey. Mm. I think for any uh, foreign or domestic power, they more or less will say how limited the value of the Gülenist as an ally in the fight or in their dispute with the, uh, with the AK Party government or with the President mm. Erdogan. So mm. this is right now Well, uh, let, let, let me then just throw the option. question to Ian Lesser. Uh, Ian Lesser, do you think the Gulenist movement is, throws a real threat to Erdogan's party, Erdogan's leadership and indeed to Turkey? Well, uh, there's no question that President Erdogan and AKP has seen the Gulenist movement, at least in recent, uh, the recent years, as a threat. But the question of whether they're behind this coup, it seems to me, is an entirely open one. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we don't really have evidence for that yet. Uh, one would not have thought that they have very strong following in the military, perhaps in other parts of the civil service and the judiciary, perhaps the security services. I think that might have been clear. Uh, but in the military, I'm not so sure. Um, there are many possible uh, motives for this, from disgruntled officers to a kind of nostalgic attachment to a, a, an old style of Kemalism uh, and military involvement in political relations in Turkey. Uh, the notion that the Gulenist movement is behind all of this, I, I think we need to treat that with a fair amount of skepticism. Uh, Jan Kasapoglu, time and again, Prime Minister Yildirim had underscored the fact that this coup was a test for Turkey's democracy. Going forward, how do you see this failed coup shaping Turkey's democracy? Well, first of all, we should see the, the aspects of democracy. The first thing when it comes to failed attempts of a coup d'etat, it is civil-military relations. The timing of the coup, uh, the coup attempt was very important because it took place right before Turkish Supreme Military Council, which is the main top body of all the promotions and appointments uh, within the Turkish Armed Forces top chain of command. So most probably we're going to see a very important reshuffle in Turkey's Supreme Military Council uh, decisions uh, in August uh, 2016. Uh, th this, this will determine the next decade of Turkish civil military uh, relations. And secondly, we see that the Turkish people cited by uh, uh, the democratically elected government, whatever their political views or political parties that they are supporting are, uh, this is very important and this was promising for Turkish democracy and also the, the position of Turkish media was very important. Uh, from now on we, we could be optimistic about the, the trajectory of Turkish democracy with one reserve uh, I, which I mentioned before, the, the uh, results of the prosecution. Because uh, the very question of who is behind this coup is very important and the answer to this question uh, would define the fate of uh, relations within Tur domestic political relations uh, within Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think still after the overnight, what happened overnight and the thwarted coup attempt, we have ground now for being optimistic. We're going to have to leave the discussion there. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for uh, being with us. Thank you to Galip Dalay, Ian Lesser and Jan Kasaboglu.
And thank you, too, for watching Inside Story. You can always watch the program again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, you can always go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Again, you can always join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Fazia Ibrahim, and the whole team, thanks for watching.